قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون صدق الله العلي العظيم My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We mentioned in our previous lectures that there are conditions to dua that if we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer our du'as, our prayers, there are conditions that we have to meet. And we spoke about the first condition. We said the first condition is ma'rifah, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said that comes in three aspects. We spoke about the first, about the second, and we spoke about the third. We said the third aspect of ma'rifatullah, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is knowing my faith. Knowing the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma'rifah of the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent through his messengers. And we said that's divided into two parts. The first part is usul al-deen, the pillars of faith. And that's the beliefs that we have in our heart. And we spoke about that yesterday and the day before. And we said the second part of our faith, of educating ourselves about our religion, is furu al-deen. And that is the Islamic laws, the Islamic legal system that most Westerners know as the Sharia, the Islamic Sharia. And unfortunately, many of the Westerners, many non-Muslims, they do not really understand what the word Sharia means. They don't understand what it implies. And it has an evil connotation to them. It's a mystery to them. It's taken out of context. There's many misconceptions about this word, Islamic Sharia. And if you remember about a year, two years ago, that uh, the Christian priest from Florida who burned the Quran, Terry Jones, if you remember him, when he was asked, he was on a show, he, when he came here, he came to Dearborn, and he wanted to protest against the Quran. And he wanted to burn the Quran in front of the Islamic Center. So he was on a show on Fox News. He was asked, why do you want to burn the Quran? He said, I'm doing it to protest against Islamic Sharia. An objection to Islamic Sharia. Now in that same interview, my father was also invited. So my father asked him, can you please, please just define what Sharia means? You want to burn the Quran because you are objecting to Sharia, Islamic Sharia. Do you even know what Sharia is to begin with? Define it to me. When he's posed with that question, he begins to stumble. He begins to, he begins to stutter. Well, you know, I don't know what Sharia is. That's not my area of expertise. But I know it's something evil. This was his answer. Can you believe that? He causes all that chaos and commotion. He's a priest. He wants to burn the Quran in objection to Sharia. And he doesn't even know what it is. He just knows it's an evil monster. That's all he knows about Sharia. So you could see the ignorance towards the subject. The Islamic Sharia is basically the Islamic legal system. What's haram and what's halal. What we're supposed to do and what we are supposed to refrain from. Which is called in Arabic al-fiqh. Al-ahkam al sharia The halal, the haram, the wajib, the mustahab, the makruh. This is called furu al deen The Islamic Sharia. Or al-ahkam al sharia And you find brothers and sisters... That because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's unlimited mercy, He did not leave any matter of life without guidance. Every single detail of our life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a law. He has a way. He has a method. And He taught us through the Quran and through Ahlul Bayt. You'd be amazed what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given how much advice and how much guidance he's given in the Quran and the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt. That you find Islam, that's why they say Islam is a complete way of life. Because it deals with everything. It has a solution, it has a method, it has a way for every single detail in your life. From the small things, as small as your personal hygiene, brothers and sisters. Islam teaches you how to take care of your personal hygiene. It's a complete way of life. Don't say this is irrelevant. It's an entire complete way of life. How to eat food. What types of food you should eat. How to walk. How to speak. How to sleep. And everything else to the big things. 
For example, how to form a government. What type of government should an Islamic government be? Should it be, for example, a capitalist government or a communist government or a socialist or whatever? What type of government should it be? Islam has a solution, has a way for every single detail of our life. And in one hadith, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says this. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى لَمْ يَدَعْ شَيْئًا تَحْتَاجُ إِلَيْهِ الْأُمَّ إِلَّا بَيَّنَهُ فِي كِتَابِهِ إِلَّا أَنزَلَهُ فِي كِتَابِهِ وَبَيَّنَهُ لِرَسُولِهِ He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave any matter of life without guidance, without telling the Prophet what's the solution. In the Qur'an or through the sunnah of Ahlul Bayt, of Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam So Islam is a complete way of life. And these laws, if we look at them, the laws of Sharia, the Ahkam al Sharia, the laws of Islam, there are a lot. I mean, you could find a book, this, probably this, this thick, which is called al Rasala al Amaliya, Minhaj al Salihin, which has all the laws of Islam. There are a lot. But what you have to keep in mind is the abundance. The ahkam al sharia there are a lot, but it's, it's not to complicate our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't legislate so many laws so that He complicates our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to complicate our lives. So why is there so many ahkam? Halal, haram, wajib, mustahab, makruh. Why? Because the human being is a such a sophisticated being. There's so many aspects of his life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to address. There's so many factors that have to be taken into consideration. He lives with other human beings and he has so many relationships with so many entities. So obviously there's going to be many ahkam, many laws. And that's why you find the government, the same thing applies. Governments, brothers and sisters, they have so many laws. Why? Just look in, in, in this country. How many federal laws are there? How many state laws are there? How many county, city laws are there? If you want to Compile them, it'll be much fatter than the Qur'an. It'll be a couple of volumes. Why are there so many laws about everything there's a law? The point of these laws is not to complicate our lives. Even though it does limit our freedom a little, but the point is to create order in society so that we can live with one another. So that another human being doesn't infringe on my right. If we were angels, we wouldn't need laws. But because we human beings need to be disciplined, because we need an external force that imposes on us being good obedient citizens. That's why you have laws. So with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same thing applies. The governments have the right to legislate, but Allah doesn't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise legislates these laws to make our lives easier, to create order in our life, to show us the right way in this complicated, sophisticated world that we live in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the route that you have to take. And not just the general route, like I said, He gives us the details. And these laws, brothers and sisters, don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that will benefit from these laws. Some people, you'll find this type of people in every community. When they pray to like as for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as if He has done Allah a favor. It's as if he's done Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala good and it's as if Allah benefited from his salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about this in the Quran. The people, they used to come to Rasulullah and they used to say, we're Muslims. So it's as if we've done a favor for you, Muhammad. It's as if, you know, I, did, I gave that person money. It's as if I did kindness to that person. And they think that they do, they've done a favor to Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this in the Quran. He says, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا They come and they tell you, you know what, we became Muslims. We've done a favor. We've done something good to you. You're benefiting from us. Allah tells the Prophet, tell them, بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّ عَلَيَّ أَسْلَامُكُمْ Don't think that you've done a favor for, for me. بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ Allah is the one that's done you a favor by guiding you to salah, by guiding you to Islam. Don't think that if I am a Muslim or I pray or I fast, I'm the one that's benefiting Allah. No, it's the other way around. I have to thank Allah that He guided me to the right path, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the success and the tawfiq to pray those two rak'ahs. Because I am the one that will benefit from these 
ibadah, from this worship. And not just in the akhirah. You might think, yes, I'm going to benefit in the akhirah, the next life. Allah will give me the heaven. That's how I benefit. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Allah, not only will He give me a reward in the akhirah, but even in this world, brothers and sisters, if we follow the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to benefit in this world. Why? Because as I said, these laws are for our benefit. They're all based on logic. They're all based on wisdom. Allah does not say any law. He does not legislate any law unless there is wisdom behind it. Unless I, the human being, benefit from it. And that's why the ulama, the scholars, they have a famous state, uh, statement. They say, الأحكام تابعة للمصالح والمفاسد. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something is haram, why? Is it just because He enjoys me refraining from that haram act? No. It's because there is harm in that haram for me. When Allah says don't drink, don't do drugs, don't steal, don't kill, don't, 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 it's because that thing is harmful. Even if Allah doesn't tell me to stay away, my intellect, my mind, my conscience says, says stay away from that. All the laws of Allah are like that. And when He says do something, when He says this is wajib, it's because there is something good in it for me. Allah is not benefiting from anything that I do. It's only I, the human being, that benefits from my worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks about this in the Holy Quran. He says why He sent the Holy Prophet to humanity. Why did Allah send the Holy Prophet to begin with? There's a verse that speaks about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّي He speaks about Rasulullah, and then he mentions the reasons why Rasulullah was sent. The duties of Rasulullah, the obligations of Rasulullah. Was it to make our life complicated and to burden our lives? No, it's the opposite. Allah says in the Quran, he says, what are the duties of Rasulullah? يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ this is number one. He tells us, he encourages us to do anything that is good. So like I said, anytime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders, orders us to do something, it's because we, the human beings, will benefit from that thing. And then he says, And he forbids them from doing evil things. So Allah only forbids us from the harmful actions. Allah is not going to forbid us from something good. And then the verse says, and any time you find that when Islam says this is halal, you can eat it, and this is haram, you can't eat it. Why? It's because the thing that's halal, the foods that are halal are healthy for us. There's no harm in them, or at least they're healthy. And the things that are haram, there is harm in them. So for example, if I ask, why is pork haram? Why can I eat cats and dogs and elephants and lions and cheetahs and so on and so forth? Why? It's because there is a harm in them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want me to eat these harmful actions, these harmful foods. So that's why he says it's haram. I am the one that's benefiting. He's just guiding me. He just wants me to live a comfortable life. And then the verse says, وَيَضَعُ عَنْهُمْ إِصْرَهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ and one of the duties of Rasulullah is to free humanity from the shackles and the burdens that were self-imposed upon them. And you find this was, self, this was very evident during the time of Jahiliyyah, when Rasulullah was sent. I spoke a little about this the last few nights. We said that during the time of the Jahiliyyah, when Allah sent the Holy Prophet to humanity, they used to practice certain rituals that were meaningless, they were difficult and they had absolutely no wisdom behind it. They did it just because everyone else did it. Just because their parents did it without understanding why they're doing it. If you ask them, did God tell you to do this? They'll tell you no. Is this, did science tell you that this is good? Did the doctors tell you this is good? They'll tell you no. Then why are you doing it? Why are you burdening yourself with these rituals? They'll tell you, because my dad did it. Because everybody else is doing it. Even though it's useless, it's meaningless. But because everyone else is doing it, I'm going to do it as well. So for example, you find that during the time of Jahiliyyah, they used to prohibit certain foods. Now we said in Islam, when Islam prohibits certain foods, it's because there's a harm in them. They used to prohibit foods for no reason. For example, Allah mentions in the Quran, 
He says, ما جعل الله من بحيرة ولا سائبة ولا the third thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ولا وصيلة ولا حام Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not prohibit any of these four. The wasila, the bahira, the ham, and the sa'ib. What are these four things? The Arabs in the Jahiliyyah, they used to believe that if a camel, if a female camel would deliver five times, would be pregnant and deliver a child five times, then you can no longer eat that camel. Not only you can't eat it, you can't ride the camel, you can't drink the milk of that camel, you can't benefit from that camel whatsoever, so it becomes just like a dead camel, useless. If that camel delivers five times, that's it, you can't use it. So you ask them, why? Did Allah say so? No. Did science say so? Because it's harmful? No. So why? Because everyone else is doing it. If a female, if a female sheep would deliver seven times, they wouldn't eat it. They wouldn't use it. It's useless. When a male camel would father ten children, ten camels, they would no longer eat it. They would no longer ride it or benefit from it. So the Holy Quran is telling them in this verse, why are you prohibiting these animals? They're halal to eat. Why are you making life more difficult than it is? See, it's self-imposed limitations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them this is nonsense. When I say something is haram, there is harmful... There's, there's a harm in it. When I say something is wajib, you have to do it because there's a benefit for you human beings in it. But when you say something is haram, you have no reason behind it. You have no wisdom behind it. So this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that all the laws of Islam, the laws of Sharia are based 100% on logic. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. And for that same reason, brothers and sisters, we always state that Islam is a religion that is completely compatible with science. You won't find any law in the book of laws, ahkam al-shari'iyah. You won't find any law that contradicts science. You won't find any alim, any scholar that will tell you you cannot rely on science. Even when it comes to the crescent, when it comes to finding the moon, sighting the moon, and deciding which night is the first night of every month and which night is the last night of every month, the ulama, they all rely on science. They all rely on astronomical data. There is no island that says we can't rely on science when it comes to sighting the moon. This is a myth. Some people, they believe that, that there are some ulama in Najaf that don't accept Science, but this is all a myth. There is no such thing. All the ulama accept science. So why is there a difference? Why does one alim say it's Monday? The other says Tuesday. One says Friday, the other Sunday, Saturday. Why is there a difference? I'll speak about this next week, inshallah. Two nights before the Eid, I have an entire lecture about why the ulama differ. It's much more complicated than you think. It's not because this guy doesn't look at science, this guy accepts science. It's a much more complicated situation. It's because their understanding of the Quran and the hadith is different. It has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with astronomy. They all accept it. It's just how they understand the Quran and the Sunnah. Now she'll speak about that next week, inshallah. So Islam is a religion that is compatible with science. And all the laws of Islam are based on logic and wisdom. But there's an important point that I have to bring to your attention here, brothers and sisters. If you remember last night and the night before, I mentioned... That in Islam, when it comes to the Islamic beliefs, usul al-deen, the aqaid, there is no such thing as taqlid. We don't do taqlid. We don't follow another alim. We don't follow our parents. When I'm asked, why am I a Muslim? Why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in the Quran? I can't say because the scholar said so. Because my dad said so. I have to be convinced. I have to be convinced and understand the reason why Islam is the correct religion. This is with Usul al-Deen. Why did I divide them into two parts? So that we understand this point. With Usul al-Deen, there's no taqlid. I have to understand why I chose to believe in these beliefs. But when it comes to furu' al-Deen, when it comes to the laws of Sharia, the halal and the haram, the wajib, the mustahab, the ahkam of salah and hajj and sawm and khums and zakat and tahara and najasa and so on and so forth, here I have to do taqlid. Because the only other option 
is I become an Ayatollah myself. I go to the Hawza and I study 30, 20, 25, 30 years and I become a scholar. And not, not all of us want to do that. So the second option, if I don't want to do ihtiyat on every mas'ala, is to do taqlid. Why is Salat al-Dhuhr for rak'az? Who says? I don't have to know the reason behind that. I follow Alim. He tells me all the ahkam of furu' al deen all the ahkam of sharia. When it comes to these laws of sharia, we can't use our judgment. There's some people that tell me, it doesn't make sense that we have to pray in this way. It doesn't make sense that I have to wear hijab, that I have to do this in hajj, I have to... Fa when it comes to the laws of sharia, there is no room for using our judgment. I can't use my own opinion unless I'm a scholar, I'm an alim, and I've studied in the hawza, and, and, and if I want to give my opinion, I can't just give my opinion however I like. I have to have proof, evidence from the Qur'an, from the sunnah of Rasulullah. Some people say, I don't think this is right. Why? Because I don't think. That's their proof. That's their evidence. This is wrong. If you, ha if you think otherwise, you have to bring me the proof from the Qur'an and from the authentic traditions of Rasulullah. And unless I'm a scholar, it's difficult to do that. So we have to, there's a very delicate point here, brothers and sisters, with the ahkam of sharia, we can't put our judgment into the situation. And that's why, let's say I don't understand the reason behind the hukum. Why is hijab wajib? Why is salah wajib? Why is listening to music, according to some ulama, sometimes the music haram? Why is eating this type of food haram? Why is this wajib? Why is this haram? And so on and so forth. If I don't understand, brothers and sisters, I can't reject the law. Do you know why? Because if I acknowledge the fact that this is the law of Allah, but yet I'm not convinced about it, but yet I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, but I acknowledge that it's Allah's law, this is nothing short of kufr. This is like I'm rejecting Allah. I tell, oh God, I know this is your law, but I don't want it. I'm not happy with it. I'm not convinced with it. This is a rejection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I accept that this is Allah's law, I can't say that I'm not convinced about it. Some people, you tell them, why don't you pray? I'm not convinced to pray. So wait, are you saying that you have doubt that prayer is wajib? He tells you, no, I know Allah has told us to pray in the Quran. I just, I'm not convinced. Why don't you wear hijab, sister? Don't you know that hijab is mentioned in the Quran in two verses that it is wajib? Why don't you wear it? Now, if she tells you, no, I disagree. Hijab is not wajib. That's a different situation. But if I acknowledge that hijab is the law of God, and I say, I don't want your law, this is like I'm rejecting Allah. It's like I'm saying, I don't care about your law. Who are you to tell me what to do? I'm going to follow my way. I don't want your way. Is this a fair way that we treat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can we treat the government like that? If I don't like a law of the United States of America, can I say, I don't like it, I'm not going to pay taxes anymore. Can I do that? No. We're so afraid when it comes to the laws of the government, the laws of human beings, but with the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're so powerful, we're so mighty in front of Allah. We dare to challenge Him, we dare to object to Him, we dare to tell Him, I don't care about your law. But when it comes to the government, let a police officer chase my car on the freeway, I shiver. I start, I start, you know, uh, panicking and I don't know what to do. Why? It's because they show me no mercy here. If I decide not to follow the laws of the government, they show me no mercy. Right away they take me to prison. Allah shows me so much mercy. He's so patient with me. Do I take advantage of that? Because he's patient with me, I continue on my deviance and, I, and, and on my diso disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this how we repay Allah for his patience and kindness? That he sees me sinning and not obeying him, but yet he says, I'm not going to. I'm not going to punish him now. Why? Because Allah wants to leave the door of repentance open. If he punishes me right then, I'm never going to repent. That's it. I got my, what I deserved. Allah says maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe in 10 years he's going to repent. So I'm going to have patience. So let's not get carried away, brothers and sisters. So when it comes to the law of sharia, I can't say I'm not convinced about this law. What's the wisdom? If I'm not convinced that this is something good for me, I'm not going to do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see the point that we have to keep in our mind is that all the laws of Allah are based on wisdom. 
and we will benefit from them. This is the general rule that you have to keep in mind. But when it comes to the details in every single mas'ala, I have to know what's the wisdom behind it? No. I just know the general. I trust Allah. Allah tells me, look, I'm your creator, and everything that I tell you to do, it's for your own good. So trust me, hold the hands of Allah, close your eyes and do what He tells you. You don't have to ask every single detail. Why is this haram? Why is this halal? Why is this haram? Unless I'm a scholar, that's a different situation. I want to increase my knowledge, yes, I could do that. But if I want to do it just because I want to get convinced, and if I'm not convinced, I'm not going to follow the law, this is challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you sit in the airplane, you see the pilot, he has thousands of Buttons in front of him. Are you going to ask him on every single one? No, because that's not your job. That's not your business. You trust the airline? Sit and enjoy the trip. This is how I have to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you know this is the law of Allah, you have no right to reject it. You have no right to say, I'm not convinced why music is haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it that way. Allah wants it that way. My job is to submit to the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unless, unless I, and I'm saying this again, unless I, my doubt goes back to it being a law of God in the beginning. Yes, I could say, who says music is haram? How do I know God said that? So I have to ask like a scholar. When I say this is haram, when an alim, when you see a mas'ala that says such and such is wajib, or such and such is haram, don't challenge it. Ask, say, I'm an ignorant human being. My knowledge is limited. Please explain to me where the proof for this hukum is. And I'll be glad to show you from the Quran and from the sunnah where it says that this is halal, this is haram, and this is wajib. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So brothers and sisters, if we did not understand the wisdom behind any law in our lives, be assured, Allah is saying this. There is wisdom behind it. You will benefit from it, but you don't necessarily have to know what the reason is. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I said, Allah didn't explain the wisdom behind all the laws to us. He only gave us some of them in the Quran like He tells us. He tells us drinking is haram because you get drunk and because you'll do so many evil acts after that. So we know why drinking is haram. But other things, we don't know the reason. Yes, there are possibilities that we can mention. But Allah never told us the reason. Science discovers the reasons as it progresses. I mean, can you imagine if Rasulullah was sent 1400 years ago, if he wants to explain to the people that, for example, pork is haram, what is he going to tell them? Science is so primitive, it hasn't discovered anything. Right now, in this era, we think we're so advanced. Imagine how much more we're going to advance a thousand years from now. The Holy Quran and Allah's laws, they're not just for that time, they're for all human beings and all times. So this is a very important point that we have to keep in mind. And these laws together, brothers and sisters, the ahkam of sharia, there are many laws, and sometimes it may be difficult to follow all these laws. Nobody said it's going to be easy. It is a little bit difficult. But this is life, brothers and sisters. This life that we live in is a test. And nobody expects an easy test. Tests are usually hard. You have to study for them. You have to... Use your brain. You have to use, uh, think when it comes to the test. So tests aren't easy. So when it comes to these laws, I have to have patience. This is the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as they say, no pain, no gain. If I want it so easily in this life, how do I expect Allah to just let me enter heaven? Some people, they do nothing in their lives. And this, you especially find it with the non-Muslims, like Christians. You find he was a person probably never attended church, that never did his wajibat. He never did anything. But when he dies in his funeral, what do they say? Oh, he's in the heavens right now. How do you know he's in the heavens? What did he do to deserve heaven? All he did was he, he was after his fun and entertainment and having a, having a good time and making money and he, de and, and he deserves to enter heaven? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. He could put all of us in heaven for nothing. But we have to go by the rules. The rules say that you have to earn heaven. That you have to work for it. And if I don't 
do salah, if I don't believe in Allah, if I don't fast, if I don't do the things that Allah wanted me to do, how can I expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to just easily tell me enter heaven? Unless I want to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes us sometimes for our sins. So it's difficult, brothers and sisters, and especially in the West, especially here in the West, being a good, faithful Muslim is not easy. It's salah time. This happens to me all the time. I'm traveling. My plane is about to board in 30 minutes, let's say. And I have to pray. If I don't pray now, I can't pray in the plane. I'm going to miss salah. So I have to pray in the airport by the gate. And everybody is sitting. All the non-Muslims are sitting and watching me. So I have to get up, take off my shoes, put my prayer rug, put the, put the, uh, the stone, and pray on it. And it's a little awkward. It's a little, for some people, it's a little embarrassing because I'm a Muslim. And people are going to have stereotypes against me. This guy's a terrorist. This guy probably is going to try to bring down the plane. This, that. So here I'm in a state of inner jihad. Should I pray? Then look down upon me. Should I not pray? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look down upon me. When I choose to pray and I stand and I say I don't care about the people. I'm going to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me to do. I know it's difficult. But Allah is greater than any human being. It's worth it. When I sit and I pray, brothers and sisters, and it's so difficult for me, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let that go just like that? When I do something that's so difficult for me, I do it just because Allah ordered me to do it. Do you think Allah is not going to reward me for that? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, Allah is much kinder than we think. When Allah sees me that I am doing such a hard thing, I'm, you know, I'm doing something while I feel embarrassed, while it's so awkward, it's so difficult for me, but I do it for Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate you and repay you like you could never imagine. I mean, think about, it's the ultimate reward, al-jannah, that the hadith says, the width, the, the verse, not the hadith, the verse, the ayah says, jannah arduha samawat wal ard. The width of heaven is as big as the entire universe and the length is more than the width. That the hadith says, مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٌ Do you know how great heaven is? The Prophet says, I can't tell you through words. It's something that no human being has ever imagined. It's no human being has, has ever heard of. It's beyond comprehension how great the Jannah is. Let's try to earn it, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never waste our a'mal. Don't think that I'll do a good deed and Allah will forget about it. The Holy Quran says, If you do a small good deed, as small as a particle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save it for you. It's all stored. Allah will show you your good deeds on the day of judgment. So it's difficult, brothers and sisters, but we have to learn these ahkam of sharia, the ahkam of salah, brothers and sisters. I see many times when I pray, I see a lot of the brothers, they're not praying the right way. When they read Surah Al-Hamd, Bismillah, they're not pronouncing the words in the right way. It's very easy. You just take a few minutes of your time to learn how to pray the correct way. Their ruku is not right. Their sujood is not right. It's all being done in an invalid way. Imam Al-Sadiq, he has a hadith. He says in that hadith, ما أقبح الرجل منكم تأتي عليه ستون سنة أو سبعون سنة فلا يقيم صلاة واحدة بحدودها التامة. He says there are some people he lives for 60, 70 years he doesn't even pray one salah that's right. Not even one salah. All his salah is wrong. He does it all wrong. His wudu is wrong. His salah is wrong. When he goes to hajj he does it wrong. When he's pray fast he does it wrong. There's rules and guidelines brothers and sisters. Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam and the Quran, they showed us how to pray the correct way. We have to follow them. We have to learn. And as I said yesterday, ignorance is not an excuse. If on the day of judgment, Allah, he tells me, why did you pray on the wrong, the wrong way? Why was your ruku' wrong? I can't tell him I don't know. Ignorance is never an excuse. He'll tell you, why didn't you ask? Why didn't you research? You had internet, you had TV, you had books, you had scholars. You never took the time to ask. And it's your fault. So I have to make sure, brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not tell me that on the day of judgment. Research. Now if I researched and then I made a mistake, fine. But some people, they don't care. He just stands and prays. 
He's never asked. He's never taken the time to learn the correct salah, the correct hajj when they go to do hajj. And I remind you, brothers and sisters, about the YMA hajj trip. Every year, the YMA has a beautiful trip that it uh, accompanied by Imam Sayyid Hassan Qazwini and some other scholars. It's all so that you learn how to do the correct hajj. You see, if you go to hajj alone by yourself, chances are you're going to mess up your hajj because hajj is difficult and it's so crowded. So you need someone to guide you. And it's all the programs are in the English language. And if you ask any of the brothers that went to hajj with the YMA group, they'll tell you how much they enjoyed it, how informative. Every day there's a lecture step by step how to perform hajj so that on the day of judgment, Allah doesn't tell you why was your hajj incorrect. You tell them, no, I went with the YMA. My hajj was good. So I encourage you, brothers and sisters, if you plan on going to hajj and you are English speaking, you don't speak Arabic too well, YMA is the best group to go with. So brothers and sisters, when it comes to these ahkam, I have to make sure that I know how to pray. I remember I went to a city once in the U.S. to give lectures. And the person that invited me, he put me in a house that he had with his two sons. One was about 17, one was, was about 20. So they were supposed to take care of me, bring me food and everything. So I arrive at night. The next day, it's noon. The, one of the sons, he comes, he says, Sayyid, we want to have lunch. What do you want to eat? I, say, I ask him, where do you want to bring from? He says, from McDonald's. He says, what do you want? Do you want the Big Mac? Do you want the chicken burger? I was like, really? You guys have halal food? Halal McDonald's here? You're, you guys are so lucky. He's like, what do you mean halal? There's no pork in it. I tell him, is it halal or is it haram? He says, there's no pork in it. I tell him, what are you talking about pork? Is the meat halal or is it not halal? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. He's 20 years old. For 20 years, he never heard about halal and haram. Where was his father? His father, mashallah, he's the first one in the masjid. He's always pray, the first one to enter and the last one to leave. He's the most pious one, but he never took the time to educate his son or daughter. If you have any sons or daughters, brothers and sisters, Allah will ask you, why didn't you educate them? Especially in this country where it's so easy, it's so, they easily get lost. Why didn't you guide them? Why didn't you teach them? Why didn't you bring them to the center? There was English lectures. So I tell him, you don't know what's halal and haram? He says, no, I just thought you're not allowed to eat pork. That's the Jewish belief. We're not Jews. And even Jews, they have their own types of foods. The, what do they call it? The kosher. So I tell him, come on, you got to be serious. You don't know what's halal and haram? He says, no. So I tell him, okay, after that, I tell him, where's the qibla? I want to pray. He says, what's the qibla? I've never heard of the word Qibla. I tell him Mecca. He says, you have to pray to Mecca? I was like, oh my God. This guy is just like a non-Muslim. He's a Muslim. His name is Muhammad. His name is Ali. His father is... A... He knows nothing. Nothing. So I had to sit down with him. I told him, come buddy, sit down. I have to start from zero with you. I have to start from ABC of Islam, of the Islamic laws with you. And I've seen many of these people across this country and especially in the West, Canada, here, UK, and so on and so forth. We have to take the time to educate ourselves about our ahkam. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, alaykum bittafaqquh biddeen. If we truly believe these imams are our role models, we have to take their words into consideration, follow their teachings. He says, educate yourself about halal and haram in the ahkam of sharia. He says, alaykum bittafaqquh biddeen. Fa'inna man lam yatafaqquh. If I do not learn the ahkam of sharia, how to pray, how to fast, how to do hijab, this and that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at me on the day of judgment. He'll abandon me. When I need him, he's going to say, I'm not going to help you because you never took the time to educate yourself about my religion. And Allah will not accept his a'mal because probably all his a'mal are wrong. He's, all, he's doing it all in the wrong way. And that's why you find, brothers and sisters, there's a hadith from the imam that says, مُتَفَقِّهٌ فِي دِينِهِ مُتَفَقِّهٌ فِي الدِّينِ أَشَدُّ عَلَىٰ إِبْلِيسِ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ أَلْفْ عَابِدِ Subhanallah. The imam, he says that if you find someone who knows the ahkam of fiqh, he knows the halal and haram. He knows how to pray. He's read all of it. He knows all the laws. This person is more dangerous 
on Iblis, on the devil, the devil fears this person more than 1,000 Abid, prostrators, worshippers. Take 1,000 worshippers. All they do is worship, but they don't know their ahkam. Just one person that knows his ahkam is greater than those 1,000 worshippers. Why? Because of those 1,000 worshippers, shaitan could easily fool them because they're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. They're just exercising. Their salah is batil. They could easily be fooled. But if I am a person who has knowledge, the shaitan can't fool me because I'm smarter than him, because I've educated myself, because all my a'mal are correct. So for the last time, brothers and sisters, we have to learn the ahkam of sharia. You pick a marja' that you think is the most knowledgeable of the maraja' and whatever he tells you when it comes to furu' al-deen, the laws of sharia, salah, salm, hajj, fasting, hijab, whatever, tahara, najasa, I follow him so that I know on the day of judgment I did what I was supposed to do. I did my obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when I come out in the public, I know what types, if I'm a male or a female, I know what I'm supposed to dress. I know what type of hijab. And hijab is not just for the women, brothers. The brothers, many brothers, they think that hijab is just for the women. Even men have a hijab because hijab means a code of conduct or basically a uniform, uh, something that you have to wear and how you conduct yourself with the opposite gender. So just like women, they have their hijab. We, the men, we also have a hijab. We have to also dress, what? We have to dress modestly. Just like the sisters, they have to dress modestly. They have to cover their hair and their body and not wear tight clothes. This is also part of hijab. If I wear the hijab, just put something on my body, but it's too tight, this is not modest. I have to be the judge. If a man looks at me, is that something that will instigate him? Is that something that is not considered as modest or is that modest? If you think it's modest, then you're fine. As long as you're modest, you're doing the hijab. You cover your body and you make sure it's loose. For the guys, the same thing. I can't expect that I go half naked in front of women and I'm, I have no hijab. This is not acceptable. So I have to dress in a modest way. Now, what's the modest way? It's not very clear. It's just the ulama, they just say dress modestly. So I come with a tank top and shorts to the masjid. This is not correct. This is not dressing modestly. I have to, if there is a woman around me, I have to dress modestly. And it's not just my clothes, it's my conduct. Some people, you'll find a lady, a sister, she's wearing a beautiful hijab head to toe, but she's flirting. And, and, and laughing with the boys. This is not the hijab. The hijab is that of your clothes and your akhlaq. You have to be modest. When you see a lady for the man, you lower your head, you lower your gaze. Like Allah says in the Holy Quran, When I see a lady walking, I don't tell my friend, hey, hey, check that out. Check that lady out. This is haram. This is called in the ahadith, zin al ayn. This is adultery of the eyes. And the same thing applies to the sisters. When they see a man, it is haram to look at that man with lust. They have to lower their gaze. So brothers and sisters, we, we have to educate ourselves about the ahkam of sharia. And wallahi, once you educate yourselves about these ahkam, you're going to feel much better. You're going to feel a sense of tranquility and peace. It's as if the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been descended upon you because you know you've done your obligation towards Allah. We have to follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt salam. And however they taught us, we follow in their footsteps. With that, brothers and sisters, I conclude with the first condition of dua. Remember our topic was, why is it that when we ask Allah, He doesn't answer? And tonight or tomorrow is Laylatul Qadr, it's the night of dua. Tomorrow I'll speak about Laylatul Qadr. And then the following night I'll go back to our topic about dua and I'll list the other conditions of dua so that if I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer my dua I know in what way I ask him I know how to ask him and I know the conditions wa akhiru da'wana in alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi tahirin